1992, two brothers made a simple game based on their love of football. What happened next was extraordinary. Top players in world football, scouted by fans of the game, like Roberto Firmino. They won multiple BAFTAs, sold millions of games every year, employing 300 members of staff and 1,300 scouts worldwide. Players in every country and every continent. Two Premier League teams partnered with Football Manager to use their tech. Bands like Robbie Williams, Paolo Nutini, James Corden, Anton Deck. It's become one of the longest running and most successful game series ever. And this man needs to keep everyone happy. We tried to make the best value for money game on the planet. Miles Jacobson started out as a beta tester when the game was first released. I wasn't working here. I was basically given a copy of Championship Manager 2 in return for two blur tickets. Since then, he has made his way to the top, being one of the most in-demand people in the world of gaming. Pep Guardiola wouldn't use the squad planner in Football Manager because he doesn't want three players for every position. I asked him about funny anecdotes that you can share with us of meeting players, managers over the year. You must have an amazing after dinner speech. There are moments when I get messages on my phone that just make me squeal at seeing the name popping up from people. Someone who just won the World Cup and I sent them a message five minutes later. Oh, well, thank you for reaching out. He shared funny stories like this. It's just nothing that you can go back to them with. Yeah. You just sit there and kind of dribble. And if all of that isn't impressive enough, we've just celebrated our four millionth player on Football Manager 23. Mars, welcome to Jimmy's Jobs of the Future. Thank you for having me. So how does it feel to be the man single-handedly behind the UK's productivity crisis? Well, <laughs> you could put it like that, but you could also put it in other ways. I mean, look, people do spend a lot of time playing football manager, hopefully not while they're at work. Yeah. So the, the whole premise of what we do, um, we know how lucky we are to do jobs that we love, okay? But there are a lot of people out there who do a job to put food on the table for their family, and they might not enjoy their daily work, so they would love to be a football manager in real life. And yeah. um, they escape into the game in the evening and go and do that. Um, it's also a great money-saving device for people who go to university because you're going to go out and drink less because yeah. you're going to be inside playing the game. So um, so hopefully it doesn't, protect, uh, doesn't hurt productivity too much. Although when the pandemic first hit um, and people were starting to be locked in, you know, there's, there's a reason why prison is a bad thing, right? Yeah. There's a reason why it's not nice being locked up and being locked up is, um, is what happens when you go to prison. So we were really worried for people with mental health at that point. So we made the game available for free. Basically, you could come in and download the game. A few other games companies did the same um, until we found out that it was then affecting the bandwidth for the emergency services because people were spending so much time downloading games. So, so we stopped doing that. Um, so maybe productivity dropped a little bit That's at true. that point with, with all the people playing it. But, um, but we tried to make the best value for money game on the planet and i think we come close oh incredibly so um and yeah i mean i've played it for hours and and yeah the the, the pound per minute uh well it's i mean it's, it's pennies isn't it it's it's extraordinary um how many hours were being played during the pandemic i'm interested I'm, a lot yeah. i mean look the the average play time per year is normally around 200 hours per person yeah during the pandemic that went up yeah. by a good 100 hours on average um, but even post-pandemic, we're, we're going to be higher than that this year with FM24. And we've, we've got the most players we've ever had with FM24 because we've really embraced subscription platforms. So Game Pass and Apple Arcade are now really important to us. And we think more about the numbers of players rather than numbers of payers. Yeah. Um, when it comes to the game, because we've built it all into our business model, we actually do quite well being on those subscription platforms. We've got more players than ever before. And when you're on subscription platforms, a lot of those players go in, they try the game, decide it's not for them, and they drop out. Um, so you would expect the average playtime hours to drop because yeah. of that, whereas those that are discovering it in those services and 
getting past that first couple of hours, they're really sticking with it. So, um, so yeah, it's it's two hundred plus hours a year, which is pretty good, I think. Yeah, and it's been like, an extraordinary success and like made up a big part of my childhood and so on. But as I've got older, I've also begun to realise the kind of like economic engine behind it is enormous, right? Like three hundred people employed here. If you were going into a school to a 16, 18-year-old Jimmy, what would you be telling him to study? What are the skills that are most in demand? So I think it needs to be before that stage. You okay. need to be talking to 11-year-old or 12-year-old Jimmy. Um, so on the programming side of things, it's maths, yeah. it's physics, it's computer science. And at the moment, I have a big issue with the way computer science is being taught in schools. Um, it's really boring. They teach it the same way as I got taught Latin in school because I'm I'm proper old, so I I had to learn Latin, and um, it's just really boring. And you've got all these incredible tech companies in the UK. We could all be doing lesson plans yeah. for schools to actually make it more interesting, and um, that's something that I've spoken to various political parties about. Would love that to be my legacy at some point to get that changed. Um, but English is really important as well. Um, and uh, art is actually really important because if you look at the skills that are there in the games industry, you have programmers, everyone knows about programmers, right? And you have artists, 2D artists, 3D artists, concept artists. Um, they all have to be able to talk to one another. So if the programmers are able to talk to the artists, if the games designers um, mm. who can come from any background um, are able to actually talk in the same language, that's really important as well. But I think people, what, what people don't necessarily realize about the games industry, because we are a creative industry, but I used to liken us to, oh, it's like being in a band. You know, you've got yeah. 20 people in the band and you all do your own things. But as you start getting a bit bigger and getting to our kind of size, we have a team of data analysts in the studio who are looking not just at sales figures, they're also looking at what screens people are visiting in game because that information can really help me as a game director decide what features we're going to work on, which features are really important that people are missing from the game. So how can we signpost people to get there? Which areas are really popular in game that we don't realize are that popular so that we can then work on, on those modes. And in, in Football Manager's case, there's a mode called Creator Club that we don't really play that much in the studio. Mm. It allows you to add in your own club with your mates in there and some players from other teams. And when I saw the data of how many people are playing it, it's like, okay, we actually need to make some improvements in that because loads of people are seeing it. And that was something we did, I can't remember whether it was last year or the year before. Um, but we have accountants in in the team. Um, we have why is, why marketing. Is just before we get, why is English important? Because people might not sort of... Communication. So it's more English language than English lit. Yeah. Um, although that's for, for our game. Um, we're one of the few games in the industry that allows the person playing the game to create their own story. Most games have their own stories. And if the script to that story is rubbish, mm. you know, it has to be at that same level as film and TV, if not higher. So narrative design and narrative writing has become a really important part of games as well. And if you I think the best example of this mainstream wise is probably Last of Us, where effectively the Last of Us TV show, it's just the game, right? Yeah. It's just the game being acted out. Yeah. But that narrative was so strong that it actually lends itself to being able to do that. And, you know, I can't wait for, for God of War um, to, to become the film that they're working on at the moment, I, I actually hope they do a series because there's so much story to actually be discovered. God of War is the, the last God of War is the best film I've ever played. It's, it's just absolutely brilliant. And the, the emotion um, that it brought out of me in certain sections of the game, just, you know, that's kind of lacking in a lot of the TV and film that we watch. Yeah. So that's why English is important for the, for the industry. And on the programming side, what, because, you know, some of the parents that listen to this, you know, programming won't really have existed when they were around. What, what skills does that require? And where are you hiring 
people from? Where do people need to be putting themselves in terms of where does football manager get its talent from? So programming um, is effectively a maths-based language. Yeah. Um, so maths is important. Physics is really important because anything that you see moving on screen requires a knowledge of physics. Um, where we tend to get people from, I and mean, we, we hire from all over the world, yeah. um, that because of the way computer science is taught in school, um, the main languages that, that are used for games are C Sharp and C++, and those tend to be taught at the, at the higher levels because there are lots of different programming languages. So we do tend to hire from university. Um, now, I didn't go to university, and the two founders of the studio didn't go to university. So that's something that hurts me a little bit. Um, but we do also um, hire directly from our own pool. And by that, um, the what's seen as the entry-level job in the industry, but actually requires a lot of skill. Um, is something called QA, which is quality assurance. And people out there looking at it will be, well, those, they, they just play the game all day. That's yeah. all they do. They just sit and play the game all day. But what they're actually doing is testing the game on lots of different configurations of computer to check that everything works, to check for bugs, to check, in our case, it doesn't break what we call the suspension of disbelief because we want people to escape into this parallel universe when they're playing the game. And anytime something doesn't feel natural, that takes you away from being in the game. Um, and lots of people in QA might have done bits of programming. Um, and if we see someone who thinks talented, we'll send them on a programming course. Yeah. And we'll get them up to speed. If we're hiring people in, we, in QA and we didn't know that they had those skills, we'll let them take the programming test. And we've got a really good record and history of bringing people through from QA finding the right role for them in the studio or keeping them in QA if that's where they want their career path to go um, and developing their careers. And if you think that I started off doing QA on the game back in 1994, um, I wasn't working here. Um, I was basically given a copy of Championship Manager 2 in return for two Blur tickets who I was working with at the time. And they used to send faxes through to the two brothers who who started the studio and who who made the first game on their own and brought some people in for the second game. Um, and I was sending them faxes with ideas and got a fax back from them going, we've got no idea who you are, but we really like your ideas. Can we talk? Um, but Mark Duffy, who's our development director here, um, when he was 14, he used to send us letters saying, I don't like your website. So it's like, okay, <laughs> have a go at doing another website. He then went off and got a job and we brought him in and he's done loads of roles in the studio and brought people through So and brought, brought himself through. And um, we like to give people careers in the studio rather than just jobs. Just. Um, Jamal, who started in the studio in QA, he was a, a footballer who didn't make it. He was at Arsenal as a kid and then I think he went to Coventry after that. Um, Came in here in Q8, it was brilliant for us. We're getting a young footballer to come in to test the game. He's going to know everything. And he turned around and went, you know, I'd like to try programming. Put him on a programming course. He's now working on the match team. And we have lots of success stories like that. And a lot of game studios work in that way. Some of them just go out and hire the people from Cambridge who got double firsts. And um, and that's great. It, it works for them. Um we're looking for people who can really make a difference to the game, whether that be in a specialist area or um, or as a generalist. And also, you another kind of like entry route into it partly is through the kind of researcher scout network that you have. Because yeah. how many people is it you employ that? Well, we've got one thousand three hundred scouts around the world just doing the men's side, and we've now started doing women's football research as well. So that's going to grow a lot. Actually, on the way here today, I got a tweet from Amir, who's our um, lead researcher in Israel, and he's celebrating his 20th anniversary working working with us. So we got him an Israel national team shirt from 2000 and sent it over to him. Um, 
as a congrats on, on hitting 20 years. And how does that sort of, how does somebody do it? Because I, again, I sort of think back to the teenage self and think oh, I could have probably sort of like been half qualified to have a go at that. And like you are, and that's one of the amazing things about sort of social media, et cetera, is you, people can sort of create a bit of a voice and kind of, rather than getting a fax number and creating a fax and sending it through, you know, people can just tap out a, a message to you on Twitter. Absolutely. I mean, on the research side of things, we've got two distinct types of researchers that are, um, the work outside of the studio. So we have head researchers who will look after a particular country. Yeah. And then we have assistant researchers who tend to be fans of the teams mm -hmm. that they're researching, but they tend to be non-biased fans. So when we, when we first put the research network together, um, it was before the internet was as prevalent as it is now. And we were actually, we went after fanzine writers because fanzine mm -hmm. writers tend to see both sides of the story. And that's the same with football bloggers now. So those would be the kinds of people that we would, um, we would be talking to. But we have lots of researchers who've worked on clubs for a very long time and they're not going anywhere. So therefore, there isn't a position at a particular club. Um, and some of those people, um, some of those people get a copy of the game for doing it and they're very happy getting a copy of the game and the head researchers are, are paid contractors and often translators for us as well. So we translate into 16 different languages. <laughs> Incredible. And what... Well, you touched on features there and you mentioned the kind of create club mode, which sort of took you a little bit by surprise with how much is being used uh, from the data that you were pulling in. What features have, what other features have worked well and what other features have not worked as well? There aren't many that haven't worked well because we normally know about that when they come, uh, when they first come in. We'll know about that from the feedback that we have internally and we've taken some out in the past. But the beauty of working around any iterations is if something hasn't worked well, we've got loads of data and um, loads of anic data, yep. as in people talking on our forums, telling us what they don't like about it. And we go back and have another go. Yeah. So there's a feature last year, which is something I've wanted in the game for years called Squad Planner. And it's a real simple thing that not enough football clubs use, but some do in real life whereby you're able to see the list of the players that you have at the club now, the list that will be at the club next year and the year after. Mm. And it helps you decide, well, do I need another right back? And I've got three already. I've got a first choice, a reserve choice, and a youth player coming through. So I don't need any more right backs. Um, but when it went into the game, there were some things conceptually that we wanted to be there that, didn't necessarily resonate with the community. So some of the hardcore players of the game just went, I've been doing this on pen and paper for years. I don't need this in game yeah. and didn't really use it. So when something like that happens, we then have a look at that feature and go, right, how can we make it user friendly? How can we make it more useful for people to be able to, to utilize it and use it? And those are things that might come in this year's game, they might come in next year's game, they might come in a game two or three years down the line because we're always looking ahead and we have a huge backlog of things that we want to do mm -hmm. that are things that may have been suggested internally, they may have been suggested on our forums, they may have been suggested by footballers and the people that we talk to from inside the football world regularly where um, each month we have a hour, hour and a half um, with someone who works in football. I interview them for 45 minutes. Then it goes to the floor with anyone in the studio is able to ask questions. But we always ask questions about features that we're working on or things that we think we should be working on to try and get the opinion of the person whose actual job it is to do and get their feedback. And with that insight, what are the jobs that have grown in football in the last? Because you've been involved with it now for sort of three decades. So what... I think the biggest, the biggest growth area for football jobs has been in data analysis. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, that's something that didn't really exist. And I'd love to say that we invented it all um, because the first time a lot of people um, knew about data and football is when they were playing 
championship yeah. manager back in the day and now football manager. Um, of course, we nicked it from the football world, from the few people that were doing it at that time. But that's probably become the biggest growth area. Um, we think that there are other big growth areas coming. We think that specialist set-piece coaches yep. are going to become a lot more prevalent. There's only around 20 of them in the world yeah. at the moment. But we, we believe that there will be more of those that are coming through. Um, and we're also seeing a lot more coaches and managers that haven't been players mm -hmm. before, or haven't been successful players before. So that's another big growth trend of people who've actually started off on the coaching path at an early age and built up those skills and the, uh, be able to analyze football in ways that only people who've played the game have been able to do before. And so... Millennials like me will have often joked with friends about writing out job applications for the Derby County manager position at various points that has arisen based on my CV at Football Manager. Now, that was a joke in my teenage years. It's quite serious now. It wasn't a joke in your teenage years. You thought it was a joke in your teenage years, but people were sending those applications in. Um, but now, they, now they're getting appointed. Will, will sweep it up. Yeah, I mean, look, before they Wolves weren't did. getting a look in, but some, some people did get letters back. I think there was um, a Wolves job about 10, 15 years ago that came up because it's before the current owners. Um, and uh, the Wolves CEO jokingly complained that 50% of the applicants had been from people who play our games. Um, but as you rightly say, there are now people coming through like Will Still um, who grew up absorbed in football mm. and as part of that was playing a lot of our games as well and he went down that coaching uh, that coaching role at 30 years old is now managing um, a club in France uh, in the top flight there he doesn't have all of his qualifications so his club are actually getting fined every game um, but he you know, the team went on an incredible run this season. They've been doing really well. And in the papers just yesterday, they were talking about Tottenham going and talking to him, which I'm kind of gutted about because um, if I ever get to buy a club, I would want Will as the manager of that club. But he's the first person who's come out and really admitted it. Yeah. Okay? There are lots of people out there who've been through that pathway before including some of the best known managers in the world, but I don't have commercial deals with them. So I can't say what their names are because they, they haven't admitted it in public yet. But it is, it's always interesting. In the days that I used to go on European tours, um, which I don't do now because I can do interviews via Zoom yeah. and save the planet a little bit by doing them that way instead. But you turn up in Portugal and someone would hear that you're there. And then you know, I used to get messages on my phone going, well, this person wants to come and meet you. Is yeah, that yeah. okay? Um, and the way that we utilize that is before we had what we call the foot talks, where we have this monthly conversation with people in football. Um, I'm cheeky enough to have phoned up multiple clubs on a Monday or a Tuesday night and go, can I come to training tomorrow? And most of them said yes. And I would turn up at a training session and be able to watch a training session, which for me, as, you know, what would seven-year-old me have thought about that? <laughs> right? Absolutely bonkers. And then I'll turn around to the to the head coach or the manager at the end of the session and go, thanks, that was really interesting. Um, are you having a team meeting or a tactics meeting? Yes. Can I come to that? And they kind of look around and go, well, I guess so. Um, and then I'd come back to the office and go, this is what I learned today. This is what we've got to add to the game. Um, that worked well when there were 30 of us in the studio or 50 of us in the studio. But as we've grown in size, it's important for that knowledge to be shared mm. with everyone, which is why we went down the route of having the foot talks. So I get to go to less training sessions now than before. Um, but people will still go on those trips. I was talking to the art team today and... Um, because we sponsor quite a few clubs, we get at the end of the season this thing called play on the pitch, which is before they rip the pitch up for the end of the season, we'll go down there and have a game of 11 aside on a proper football pitch. And the art team was saying, well, you know, we're going to utilise that time to go along with our cameras and just take photos of rivets in stadia 
to try and make sure that we're getting the rivets right and the seats right and all these other parts that make up the stadium. So people will take advantage of, of those things in, in that kind of way. But our match engine team, um, and although this is actually something I won in a charity auction um, rather than something that, that we phone up and ask for, but they had a trip to Sky Sports Studio on Monday to watch Monday Night Football to learn about how they were talking about the game during the match off camera, as well as how they were putting the analysis tools together because the match engine team also work on the match analysis side of things in the game. So, so the ideas come from everywhere. But, I, well, for those watching, um, or for those listening, rather, you can check out on our YouTube video, Mars's Office, which is like a, a boy's dream of football shirts and artwork. And I, But I remember actually, like, you know, gosh, being excited to check out the new picture that you'd have of Pride Park or whatever on that might be one of the first things that we'd all get really excited about. Like, and it is the all those kind of different jobs that are you, you sort of pra- perhaps don't appreciate that there's roles for everyone involved what what are the roles are you seeing you mentioned set piece coaches what are the kind of coaches because the the elite players now are trained so well that the the margins are just so fine in top level football and sport more generally so one of the secrets about football um is that coaching at a senior level is very much team-based so where isn't any other job out there um you can go and do individual training, mm. right? And we spend hundreds of thousands a year on training team members in whatever area they want to be, whether that be through Udemy or whether it be through specialist courses. And I'm sure you've had some mm. training for doing this kind of stuff, right? Um, the best footballers don't just go home in the afternoon. They don't just go and play golf they actually employ individual coaches themselves. And that can be different types of coaches. So so a striker might want to look at video analysis of his position or her position on the pitch um, the weekend and where they should have been standing to get better XG, better chances of scoring. Um, few actually go off and do... If you go off and, and do um, sprinting training and things like that, but it's it's actually quite odd. Football is behind a lot of other sports mm-hmm. because in tennis, in motorsport, in golf, you get a lot of um, a lot of people going off and doing the weirdest things for individual coaching. How can I think three milliseconds faster? Yeah, um, and football and all sport is. It's all about marginal gains. If if you're playing in a Premier League team, you're a pretty good football. So how can you get those marginal gains to go further? And the clubs that have concentrated on that are the ones that tend to surprise people. So Brighton and Brentford, mm-hmm. really good examples of clubs that are trying to find ways to get marginal gains and think outside the box. Mm. They do a lot more due diligence on players. Um and have other businesses that are involved in football data as well. Um, and again, some of the biggest clubs, some of the biggest club groups in football spend way more time on data and data analysis. So even breaking into football, computer science can help because clubs looking for those marginal gains, they want the best minds to be going in and putting together algorithms for how how they can look at players differently. Um, because football has cost a lot of money. Yeah, they do. But also, you talked there about actually getting them to play as a team. You know, one of the great examples this season, Arsenal sort of buying a lot of you know, Man City reserves, but have been gels. And it's... Yeah, I, I don't... I mean, look, Zinchenko has been magnificent this season. All the data will tell you that he was magnificent for City as well. Um, I think he was an absolutely fantastic purchase. For Arsenal, Odegaard is definitely reaching his potential. Um, and Odegaard, we, we can't have players who are under 16 in football manager because of child protection law, mm. but we've still got scouts watching them. And someone reached out to me on Twitter a um, long time ago now and said, you know, is Martin Odegaard going to be in the game? And my reply back was, he's under 16, so no, he can't. What will it take for him to be in the game? 
I would need his parents' permission. Two days later, I had a picture of Martin Odegaard's father holding up a sign saying, I agree for Martin to be in the game, he signed his dad. Um, and the power of social media on that was brilliant. So people have been using Martin Odegaard in Football Manager since he was 15 and he becomes a superstar. And then when he was in Madrid and not getting in the first team, we thought, well, oh, maybe we've got that one wrong. We don't like getting things wrong. So it's brilliant seeing him doing so well for Arsenal this season. But the way that they've been building that squad has been um, brilliant for me. So Arteta wants to play a certain way and has gone out and found players who can play that certain way. Um, and if players weren't on board, he bombed them out yeah. of the club. Um, so yes, they've been magnificent this season with those final couple of pieces of the jigsaw. Um, and, you know, some of the other younger players there may suffer a bit because of that, because... They've maybe slipped down the pecking order a little bit. They've got injured. Um, so it's difficult for them, but they've been so exciting to watch. But we we still don't know, of course, whether they're going to win the league or whether <laughs> Man City are going to win the league at the time of recording this. And City are coming to their own now as well and are just being magnificent. Who do you think will win it? Um, at the time of recording, the Arsenal City game still hasn't happened. Yeah. So, um, so I think that's going to be the biggest thing. Um, City have the experience of getting the titles across the line and, of course, have um, have a robot playing dent for them because I refuse to believe <laughs> that Haaland is human. Um, I am going to ask you about AI. Okay. So. <laughs> um, Arsenal signing Jorginho is actually quite interesting mm. because he's someone that's won a lot of trophies. So can he push them over the line? Um but as I'm not an Arsenal or a Man City fan, I don't actually care who wins it. I just want to see great football and as much great football as possible. And it's certainly going to be a heck of a finish this season. Absolutely. No doubt about that. And what is, how do you try and recreate that sort of mental side of things? You know, you've just been touching on it there. Like it is one, you know, Arsene Wenger's called it the final frontier in football and, and so on. Like how do you try and recreate that in the game? So we do have some stats that aren't easily visible to people in the game mm. about mental strength. Um, it's probably that and the match engine are the two, what I class as the hardest things to get right. Trying to get player personality rights are really difficult because we haven't met every footballer in the world. Yeah. You know, you're just judging it on what happens on the pitch rather than what they're actually like off the pitch. But we have a lot of fun later on in the game with what we call new gens, which are players that are generated by the computer, or we can have more fun with the mental side and um, stretch things a little bit. So players not turning up for training, players who really don't care, they just want to get their salaries. Yeah. It's harder to do that with real world footballers because uh, we could get sued. Yeah. So, um, so we have to be a little bit more careful when it comes to that side of things. But you absolutely have attributes in the game like determination, like work rate, like big matches, yeah. stats when players will just perform in big matches and, and not in others that can really help um, drive that side of the game, mentality side. And on that as well, when I asked people, when I told people I was interviewing you, the one question that came time and time again was like, you've got to ask him about the Wonder Kids and particularly the Wonder Kids that didn't work. <laughs> yeah. And I know your I know your views on this and you've got the Tonton Zone and the Coco show. We do, we do. And and as a company, we celebrate those things because some of those have been really famous players. Look, in Tonton's case, Tonton Simon Makuku was an incredible talent and his story is actually really sad. He's told his story. He lost his mentor at an early age and um, and that really hurt him. And if you talk to someone like Cherno Samba, he'll be like, no, my fault. I thought yeah. I was going to Liverpool. I thought I'd made, I stopped working as hard. Um, for me, and I'm I'm quite hard on myself on this, they're data errors. They're things we got wrong. And we have a 99% plus strike rate with our, with our scouting network of getting players right. 
which is way higher than most football oh, clubs gosh, yeah. um, get to. But, um, but yeah, every time we get something wrong, it hurts, and I take it personally. What about Freddie Adu? Well, Freddie... Um, Freddie's not someone that I've met. Um, at 14 years old, Freddie had the world at his feet and didn't reach the heights that he got to. And from the interviews that I've read, um, doesn't blame himself for that. He blames everyone else. Maybe, maybe he uh, he might be right. I wasn't there all the way through his career, so I didn't see it. But he was such a talented kid. And um, it wasn't just us that tipped him to be a yeah. big talent. You know, he had McDonald's ad when he was 14. So that he was in the US national team, I think, at 15. Um, so everyone expected him to make it and his career just stalled. It was a bit like my football career, apart from the fact that he had the talent in the first place, whereas I didn't have any. My head knew exactly what I should be doing, but my feet did something completely different. So I've just made games about it instead. <laughs> I had a maths teacher who said he was a perfect footballer just trapped inside a useless body. Yeah, which is always so... I like that. I may well steal that one for the future. Um, and and the future of video games, right? Because you know, you started off in the music industry. It is a creative industry. It's becoming bigger than the film industry, as you kind of alluded to. What does the future of video games look like? Well, I wish I knew that because if I knew that, I'd be doing it now and we'd be first at everything. So um, I do think, you know, we've been using AI for years inside the game, okay, uh, in, inside Football Manager um, and Championship Manager before it. Our match engine is completely driven by AI. The players make decisions every one quarter of a second on the pitch um, based on their attributes. Um, I do think as an industry, we will be embracing AI a lot quicker than other industries. and. Um, so that's going to be an important part of it. Um, you will hear lots of people talking about VR and the metaverse. Um, there is no such thing as the metaverse. There's going to be metaverses. There will be lots of them. Um, and VR, um, is something that is there for gaming, but I think it's mainstream takeover is a lot further away than, than a lot of other people think. Um, there's still money to be made by people that are doing that, by it, but it's still quite a small audience when you look at the rest of the world. I think there's huge growth for the games industry over the next decade as 5G and 6G start taking off, in, um, particularly in the Middle East, in India, in Africa, because that's going to open that whole world to, to gaming. Um, and people playing games on their mobile phones that we in the West are, are used to playing on consoles, on TVs, through streaming services, whether those be, um, whether it be Microsoft's service at cloud or, or whether it be something else, it's going to give them the opportunities to, to play games via the internet on their phones that they've never had the chance to play before. So it's both on a business side and on a creative side. Graphics are going to continue to get better. Um, I was going to say, what will 6G allow us to kind of do? I don't know yet because I don't know whether anyone's even invented it. But, you know, there's been 4G, there's been 5G, so I presume there's <laughs> going to be a 6G, right? Um, the problem with 5G is the difficulty that it has getting through walls. Yeah. Um, so... There's only one place in London that I've known 5G on my phone to work, which is Islington. I'm sure there are other parts of London where it works as well. But as soon as I go into a restaurant, I lose the signal and go back to 4G. Um, not that I really need 5G when I'm walking around Islington because playing Pokemon Go, it works fine on 4G, right? Um, but um, 6G, I expect, will be higher speeds and hopefully they'll fix the problem of it going through walls. Um, but 5G hasn't been fully rolled out yet. Um, and when that starts hitting countries that aren't big games markets at the moment, that is what opens up those markets. And, um, you know, a few billion, a few, few billion more people could be playing games at that point. And how many players do you have at the moment on Football Manager? 
Um, we've just celebrated our four millionth player on uh, on Football Manager twenty three. And how do you? Yeah, one of the things that's been really impressive about it is the way that you've adapted to new formats as well in terms of like iPad um, and iPhone as well. Like, what you've been really impressive at, at that because there must be a temptation with we've got this amazing game that lots of people buy but each time you've sort of adapted to it what do you see coming down the line like that that may change formats well one of, one of the important things that we've always looked at is making games for the people who play on a particular format so our full game whilst we do get some people turning around and going i want the pc on your phone the realism the realistic thing is you don't because one, you wouldn't be able to see anything on screen. You wouldn't be able to see it all. And we've done Football Manager Classic on Apple Arcade, which looks absolutely brilliant on an iPad. But um, I've got what I'm going to coin someone else's term here. I've got old person eyes. So I struggle to see the text on a phone. So the obvious next step is, right, what can we do with the skin? What can we do with the user interface to actually make it a better experience for people yeah. on those devices. So we've always looked at the device itself. And when we first went to mobile phones, um, it's a game that's directed by Mark Vaughan, who's been with us for a very long time. And the design brief was to make the perfect game to play whilst you're on the toilet um, and having to play it one handed as well so that you could be <laughs> wiping your bottom with the other hand. Um, and when you're looking at those kinds of design briefs and trying to get your head around them, that can really help steer yeah. you to success because you've got to think about the screen size. You've got to think about the audience. Um, I think in, in future, one of the things we're going to see, I'll do that. Thing. In, in future, one of the things that we're going to see, um, is a lot more subscription platforms and yeah. playing games through subscription platforms. And some games don't work on those platforms business-wise. If you have a six-hour single-player game and you release it on a subscription platform, you are unlikely to sell a lot of games. Yeah. Because everyone will finish it on the subscription platform and, and that's that. If you have a game of the replayability of something like our game or something like City Skylines or um, games with great multiplayer that have people playing multiplayer a lot, um, those games will be um, business-wise a lot more appropriate to be on those platforms because people who aren't on those platforms will still go and pay to get the, the, the experience of playing them against the bigger audiences that are now on the subscription platforms. Yeah. So it actually brings more people in. Um, and it's why the free-to-play business model has worked really well in games as well because... It's free. People can just come in and try it. And then if you want to customize stuff, you can pay and, and, and do that. But you have to be a real mainstream game. Um, so there will be more platforms. Um, there will be a time when it's happened on a few TVs now where gaming platforms are going to be built into tellies. Yeah. So you will be able to go and buy a telly and you have a control pad and you are playing game pass or you are playing apple arcade on that tv without having to buy any other hardware um will help increase the audiences as well um so the streaming side of things i think is really important and um games engines are really important as well in the direction that they're going in so there are two main players at the moment one called unreal and one called unity um the graphical fidelity that is possible in Unreal 5 is astonishing. And it's going to be, if it isn't already, the de facto platform for films to use for VFX and, and art, let alone and some of the things that have come from that will be stunning. But the hardware needs to be able to handle it as well. Yeah. And Unity itself is being used in films as well. Are you going to bring in more things like scenarios as well? Because one of the interesting things in the game over recent years has been, you know, sort of, which I particularly like not having as much time as you being set up with a scenario. You've got to pay a couple of quid to kind of 
unlock it or whatever but is that going to be something that you pursue a bit more of as well yeah so challenge mode is something that is important to mm -hmm. us as a, as a studio particularly when we are trying to get into new markets um and people who are going to be dipping their toe in the water because like you don't have the time yeah. um to, to play it as much as you'd like so yes those kinds of things are important and we're we're constantly looking um at the market and one of the things we brought in in the last few years, and we used to do this a lot less. So there was a long period where we only really cared about our real hardcore consumers and most of the game features that we were working for that one consumer base. We then looked at it as we started growing and we started looking more at the hardcore user, the returning user, who are the people who might buy the game every couple of years um, and the new user when we started adding in tutorials mm. and things like that into the so we had three three personas as they get called by marketing uh people around the world and um, we now have six different personas and okay. we're, we're a lot more um ingrained and every time um, me and the design team looking at a future at a feature we declare which of the personas this is going to be good for to try and have a balance there so that the hardcore are getting some things the new person just won't care about but they will because they've seen so much stuff in the game already that all oh, this is something new just for me um but making sure that there are also uh also features there for the different personas who play the game um which we've identified as six or play the games to make sure that there's something there for everyone each year we didn't really, in some ways, we didn't succeed in that with FM23. There wasn't enough stuff there for the hardcore player in FM23. Um, so, but we learn each year. Um, and I wanted to share a moment with you about screens and the the language around it. During when I was at Downing Street, I used to play Football Manager on my phone as a bit of escapism. And I remember one of the scenes when England won, won the World Cup in 2023 and it flashed up a new screen. And that's so strange sometimes on Football Manager because instantly it's like, what's this? You get so used to kind of recognising it, you can basically read it without almost seeing it. And it said, England have won the World Cup. And the Prime Minister has congratulated on England winning the World Cup and said this would never have been possible without Brexit. I tell you, Miles, if you'd seen me at that moment, I had like a thousand yard stare because I was like, we're going to be talking about this forever and we're going to be relating it to everything forever. And yeah. <laughs> so so we have various different scenarios there. And um, I think for anyone who follows me on Twitter, um, I've tried to stay neutral on the subject. <laughs> but I, I That doesn't happen on Twitter. I don't. I, well, I tried to be as neutral as possible. I um, don't really think Brexit's been that great for us so far. Um, maybe it will be in 10 years' time. Um, but we added Brexit to Football Manager in a number of ways. So in mobile, yes, it's there. And that, that is actually a bit of a jokey comment. Yeah, so yeah. it would be depending on who we thought would be in government at that time in the game. Um, you could have had a statue instead, which would have been cooler, I think. Um, but when we added Brexit into the game, um, it was before, it was just after the vote. Literally, the vote had happened on the Thursday and I was due to go away with a charity on the Friday. Um, and we cancelled the trip because they needed to work out where their funding was going to come from if they weren't going to be in Europe anymore. So I sat, and this is not a nice sight for anyone, but I sat in my pants on my sofa for the weekend um, wishing that I was on a trip um, visiting displacement camps in Africa, which is where I would have been going to see the phenomenal work that war child do out there um and wrote down every single potential scenario that could happen to football because of brexit what were the work permit rules going to be yeah. what else could happen and as i went down that really deep rabbit hole i was working out that it's not just going to affect football it's going to affect tourism because people come over to the uk to watch football yeah and if football becomes weaker because of Brexit rules, if the Premier League becomes weaker because they can't bring in as many players as before, um, then that's going to be bad for tourism. So we put all of these different scenarios into, into FM. There were hundreds of thousands of them. Um, and as you know from the political world, um, different newspapers kind of 
uh, carry different thoughts about these kinds of things. So it was, we had a one in a million chance that Ireland reunited yes. because of Brexit, which actually, given what's happened in the last few years, wasn't that outrageous. Front page news in Ireland, um, someone from one of the political parties turning around and going, well, we're not asking people for an outright ban of the game because uh, we'd probably lose some supporters if we did that. And he are just laughing about it. And the Scottish independence issue came up as well. And, um, and we gathered all of the data that we saw of what happened depending on which version of Brexit you got in the game. Um, and I delivered all of that to Tracy Crouch, um, who is, for me, a brilliant politician, a fantastic human being. Um, and she listened to all the data and um, I tried to, I basically picked out the version of Brexit from the game was going to be the best for UK PLC, as you'll know from your time there, as the country was called for a while yeah, yeah. Um, in, in number 10, um, but went into all the financial impact on tourism and, and all of that kind of thing as it, and then, um, and then I had to try and persuade different football organizations that this is the way to go, who all had their own agendas. So, um. So we didn't get the exact version of Brexit in football that I would have liked to see, but um, but it helped steer the conversation and it helped people understand it and all that from a little computer game. Yeah. Um, and me talking to a bunch of academics Maybe. before we put it in there to find out whether any of the things that I was thinking might be right and talking to politicians across both sides, um, or all three actually, um, both sides and the middle do you, do, you, do you think politicians take video games sort of seriously enough? I mean, you know. So, enough? No. Look, yeah. there are some who get it and there are some who don't. And those that don't probably enjoyed Latin lessons when they were at school. Yeah. Um, but I don't think we're taken seriously enough as an industry. I don't think we're taken seriously enough as an employer. I don't think we're taken seriously enough as a future employer. And I don't think we're taken seriously enough as an entertainment medium. But we probably like that. We like being the underdogs. Um, and, you know, as you've said, we're, we're a decent employer. We're, we're part of the Stratford Regeneration Project yeah. post-Olympics. Um, 279 full-time people, 1,300 uh, people in our scouting team. Um, we develop people. Um, but we don't really shout about that that much. And... You know, if people think there were six people sat in a room wearing yeah. wearing white coats, that's fine. The amount of times you've got called boffins <laughs> as well. No one who gets called a boffin likes being called a boffin, boffin, right? And when I think boffin, I immediately think of Beaker from the Muppets. <laughs> um, and it, it's just... Um, but as, a, as an industry... We are making more money than music. We are making more money than film um, for for the economy. And the UK, as we are in music and film, are way ahead yeah. of where we should be, given our population size. Um, very, very proud of the creative nation um, that we are, nations that we are um, in the UK. And that should be celebrated more, I think. Um, but some of the politicians do get it. I mean, look, we have parity in tax breaks yeah. to the film industry now, which is something that I didn't think I'd see in my lifetime. So it's incredible that we've got that because it does encourage investment here and it does encourage jobs here. It's really, really important um, that we're getting. But but we don't ask for more credit yeah. because, because we are a bit more introverted than... Um, some other than, than some other industries. As someone who's worked in two of them directly and across one, yeah, um, there are a lot less egos in games. Although oh, mine's massive. <laughs> um, we've just got. I think that's a great sort of finish. We've just got some quick fires that we wanted to ask you. Um, hey, uh, I can't believe you're going to finish on what was a joke, but 
but That's lots of people it. won't take it that way. Sorry, <laughs> Andrew. You just know that that one's going to get quoted for years to come, right? Uh, Andrew's the, uh, the the PR guru that we've got here. Um, so, who is the most underrated Premiership player? Wow, that's a big question. Um, this season, yeah. Granit Xhaka. Great answer. Most valuable player in the Premiership? Haaland. Um, players that might go into management? Ooh, lots of these. Um, not just because they play the game, but I know they're doing their badges. I, I really hope Troy Deeney goes into management. Mm. I think he'll be absolutely fantastic. I really hope Tom Cleverley goes into management. I think he'll be brilliant. Um, I hope Ilkay Gundanen yeah. goes into management. He'll he'll be fantastic. Um, Dan Gosling. I know I'm naming a few Watford players here, but I tend to know them. Hughes. I tend to know them best. I'm not sure whether Will will, will or not. He's got a um, bit of a brain on him there. Hasn't yeah, he? he has. Very very clever guy. Um, don't know whether he started his badges since he, he went to Palace. I haven't mm. spoken too much. Um, who else? Um, I would like to think that there will be some of the more technical players. So I'd love to see Odegaard um, going to management. Um, I think it's more likely to be uh, centre-backs are more likely to go in there and, and full-backs um, maybe. Why is that? Uh, they have to read the game in a very different way to strikers. They have to be watching midfielders. They have to be watching attackers the whole time. But football has changed a lot for defenders. So 10 years ago, defenders were the people who would just knock someone off the ball and then clog it out the ground. You now have a lot more skill amongst the defenders. So they understand, for me, they understand the game a lot better than a lot of other positions. So if you see someone, you know, we spoke about Sinchenko earlier. Mm. Is he a defender or is he a midfielder? I mean, you could literally have him playing anywhere, right? But he can play across the back. He's a little bit short for for a centre back, but he can play there. Um, same with someone like Kieran Tierney. They can play across so many right. different positions, um, and I think that's really important. Um, I saw some quotes this week about how. Pep Guardiola wouldn't use the squad planner in Football Manager because he doesn't want three players for every position. He wants every player to be able to play in three positions. So with a lot of the City team, they are perfectly set up to move into management. Um, and one ex-player that I've spoken to who hasn't broken into management yet, he's been doing coaching, but um, I look forward to seeing him being given his chance, is Yaya Toure. He used a football brain. Had a fascinating conversation with him a few a few weeks ago, and wow, he'll what, be great. What was he saying? It's just the way that he was talking about football is different to the way that football fans talk about football. So it's that intrinsic knowledge of where someone should be on a pitch, where they should be playing the ball to, um, the understanding of modern day roles rather than positions um and the understanding of what a player goes through as well mm -hmm. through the, the good times and the bad times and it was just a really really nice i had 10 minutes with him and was just it's not starstruck I'm, I'm pretty lucky that i don't get starstruck when i'm when i'm meeting people but some people just blow me away and you get a little bit. Aura. You get a little bit tongue-tied because of their aura and because of what they're saying. It's just nothing that you can go back to them with. Yeah, you just sit there and kind of dribble a bit and and uh, and try and think of another question to ask them when they've just answered. What is it in Hitchhiker's Galaxy? You know, the the answer to to the universe is forty two. Yeah, if yeah. someone in ten minutes can basically answer every question that you might have about football. That's pretty good going. Who's got the best transfer policy of recent years? All um, Brighton or Brentford. Uh, who would you rather manage, Watford, Jurgen Klopp or Pep Guardiola? <laughs> Anyone coming into Watford at the moment is going to struggle. <laughs> um, I would... Uh, I'm going to go for Jurgen Klopp 
because I don't think Watford could attract the kind of players that would be able to play Pep's style of football. Really just Pep, that. for me, is the best head coach poss- the world possibly ever seen. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I don't think there are enough Harry Potter fans that the Harry Potter studio being in Watford is going to attract them to the club. Um, any thoughts on bringing classic players into football manager like FIFA have done? Um, yes. Uh, and no. Um, <laughs> so we've thought about it and thought what a bad idea it would be <laughs> from a football manager perspective. So look, there are some updates out there that people can download off the internet that people have made that have the classic players there. Okay. But one of the beauties of football manager is you don't know how all the players are going to turn out. Yeah, It takes a moment in time. And from that moment in time, anything can happen, right? So if you already know how all of those players turn out, for me, it takes away quite a lot from the game. Um, if you could go back and tell Miles, 22-year-old Miles something, what would it be? Um, stop smoking. Yep. That's uh, good advice. What's the most seasons anyone's got to? On oh, that? there's there's a world record on this, and I don't know what it is, but it's four figures, isn't it? It's four. F- so the Guinness World Record holder is someone in, I, th- I believe they're in Poland, um, and it was, oh, was it on FM 2019? 18 or 19, and yeah, thousands, thousands of seasons. Wow. It's scary stuff. What's your favourite shirt that you've got in the office? Oh, well, um, it's one that isn't up yet. So there is a space in my office in between Zidane and Mo Salah, which is going to be Fran Kirby. Ah. And Fran is so skillful. She's just the kind of footballer that I absolutely love. And I spent years trying to find a Fran Kirby signed shirt and we managed to get one. Um, and I could have probably asked her for one, but that's that I would never do that. So the, the, the space that's there is for Frank Kirby signed shirt. And but Jimmy mentioned it earlier. There is a ridiculous collection of shirts. This like from <laughs> Pele, David Beckham. I mean, we've got a David Beckham shirt of every club he played for that he signed across, including when he was on loan at Preston. Oh wow! Right. So that was wow. my favourite shirt because yeah, it's yeah. just an incredible collection. Um. Uh, there are Lionesses shirts. There are England shirts. Um, we have a, a room of number 10s. Like, yes. that, is, <laughs> that is utterly ridiculous. The, the collection is something I'm really, really proud of that I've built up over the years. But at the moment, I can't wait for that Frank Kirby shirt to actually come in and be hung up in the office. And what do you think the future of the female game is going to be for Full Manager? So I know it's something you're putting quite a bit of we work are, into. We're, we're working on it. Um, we've invested a lot of funds in it. Um, I would love to say it's going to be this year, but I don't think it is. Um, so it'll probably be next year. Um, there will be a blog about this at some point in June um, where we'll be going into a lot more detail on it. But there are a few hurdles that we still have to cross, some of which are development-wise and some of which are football-wise. I, there are, we basically need to... Um, there are some countries where women's football isn't taken as seriously as it is in other countries, and it's utterly disgusting. And we need to change those attitudes. Um, any... Funny anecdotes that you can share with us of meeting players, managers over the year. You must have some, you must have an amazing after dinner speech. One of the reasons why we are able to talk to so many people inside football and that so many people trust us to come in and do things like Don't the foot talk with, like with nothing leaking is I never reveal those stories. Yeah. So, um, so. There are there are moments when I get messages on my phone that just make me squeal at seeing the name popping up from people. It's ridiculous the access that we have. Um like without revealing the name, someone who just won the World Cup and I sent them a message saying congratulations, thinking I'd never hear back from them. Five minutes later, I got wow, well, thank you for reaching out. So, you know, there there are all kinds of ridiculous things, both from people who play the game and people who don't play the game. Um, 
some of the favorite anecdotes in in my head people literally laughing about what we do about football manager thinking there's nothing there at all and having someone sitting next to them who was a peer of theirs going no you're wrong you really should be looking at data um but i don't do kiss and tells Fair enough. <laughs> and if we if we interviewed somebody else from the uh entrepreneur video game industry if you were passing the mic who should it be um mike biffle is a very interesting person he uh used to work for games companies and then um set up his own studio made a game called thomas was alone on his own um and has just made the john wick game and is working on the tron game at the moment so you've got someone who literally built it up himself from this tiny little Amazing. tiny little thing um debbie bestwick as well at team 17 yes um is incredible though she's just stepped down as ceo but she's going to stay involved she's taken a company that's been going from 30 years uh, for 30 years that basically a bunch of mates who worked in a game shop made a little game called worms yeah. to a stock market listed publisher um so also utterly fascinating and if you can ever get hold of Dan Hauser or Sam Hauser, the people behind Rockstar. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I don't remember them ever doing an interview. So that's probably quite a difficult one to we'll get. We'll try, though. But there are so many great entrepreneurs in the games industry that have built up huge companies that no one's ever heard of. Um yeah, exactly, because there's like those, double, double those, 11 in Middlesbrough. Double and... 11, um, you've got 4J in Scotland who do a lot of the um, work on Minecraft now. Um, there are so many great British studios. David Braben, Ken yeah. Cambridge, um, Dennis Habib, Hassabis, who, you know Dennis, yeah, um, yeah. you know, used Beam to make Park. games and then then did, he's now DeepMind, which is part of Google, um, Google's AI. I, keep, I do keep inviting Dennis on. And he keeps saying no. He keeps saying no. He keeps replying, which is always encouraging. He keeps I, saying I, I no. I don't remember him ever doing an interview. No. So, um, but yeah, there's there's so many great people in the industry, but we're all quite shy. Yeah. Well, Miles, it's been brilliant to have you on. Like, we believe that there's growth in games and growth in sport. And so to hear what you guys are doing and your future plans has been incredibly exciting. So it, thanks it, so much. It's an honor and a privilege. And if you are still awake at this point, thank you for listening. <laughs> thank you.